little brother, his name was Gary. He passed away when he was seven. He had a brain tumor. And then I have, uh, I have uh, three sisters. I have uh, Kathy is my oldest sister, and Barb is the next one. And Sherry was my twin sister, and she just went home to be with the Lord about six months ago. Oh Died with cancer. And uh, my wife's name is Vicky. She, got, she come from Sneeville, too. And I have three children. I have Tara. She's 31. And I know it, it's hard for you to believe I have a child that's 31 years old because I look like I'm about 31. <laughs> <laughs> then I have a son that's 20, 26. And then I have a, a, a Caleb. He's 17. He kind of slipped up on us. But it was a good slip. He's a good fella. Amen. My boys are big old boys. They're big, tall boys. I don't understand that. I don't, I'm a little short, dumpy thing. And Caleb, he's, he's about that tall. He's about 6'2". He'll weigh about 300 and some pounds. He's going to be my bodyguard, you know, when I go somewhere. And uh, I've been there at that church for 28 years this February. God's really been good to me. And I have uh, saw your pastor down through the years at camp meetings and stuff. And I'm just so thankful that he, he asked me to come down here and, and preach to you this week. I know there's so many other preachers who are more qualified than I am. Uh, well, I, I don't say qualified. Let me say they're better preachers than I am. But I appreciate the privilege to be with you. What a blessing that is. Last night I preached on the subject, Jesus Saves. And I talked about how Jesus saves. And tonight I'm going to preach that same theme. I'm going to keep going on there, not the same message, but I'm going to talk to you tonight on Jesus saves and how Jesus saves, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about Jesus saves by justification, and I believe that'll be a blessing to you tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help me. Dear Lord, I pray you'd help me now. I sure do need you. I pray you'd forgive me for all the times I've failed you. If there's any sin or anything in my heart or life that tonight would hinder me from preaching, please move that out of my life. And dear Lord, I prayed I could be clear tonight. May my voice be clear. May my yes. thoughts be clear. Lord, may it be easy for me to preach. May it be easy to listen. Yes. Lord, I ask tonight you give me love, that I may love these people. Yes. I pray, Lord, you give me faith to believe that what I preach is not going to return void. Lord, I pray you give me wisdom to know what I should say and what I shouldn't say. And dear Lord, more than all, I pray you'd fill me with our Holy Spirit. Yes. And I'll give you all the praise for all you do in the wonderful name of Jesus our blessed Lord and Savior. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 3, and we're going to look down through here just a few verses, but leave your Bibles open there tonight because I'm going to be going through several of these verses tonight in Romans chapter uh, chapter 3. I preached so hard there last night and last week I was in revival <clears throat> that my voice is a little bit scratchy, so I'm going to try not to, I'm going to, try not to do that tonight, but I can't promise you nothing, Okay. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, following. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to, the, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little while, and then I'm going to, I'm going to bring you to the Scripture to share what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you not about being saved by the work of justification. This sermon that I'm going to preach to you tonight, being saved by justification is the peak, the doctrine of our salvation. It goes all the way back to the time of Abraham and how God justified Abraham by faith. Amen. If you don't believe that, just look over to chapter 4 right there. You're chapter 3, look at chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God, for well, what saith the Scripture? Here it is. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Isn't that good? And so we see it goes all the way back to Abraham. There are, the, there are three books in the New Testament that are the theme. Justification is the theme. There's the book of Romans. 
There's the book of Galatian, and there's the book of James. Now, in this book of Romans tonight, we're picking out a portion of that. The Bible tells us over and over again the truth of justification. That was the theme that was preached in the 1500s, in the 1600s, in the 1700s, and the 1800s. The, the matter of justification, now watch this, is the hallmark, hallmark of Bible preaching and of revival. You'll not have revival without preaching and having that come about justification. If somehow or another tonight, we as a church, you people here tonight, the folks who have come, the preachers and so forth, if somehow or another tonight, we could begin again to preach on this great doctrine of justification, not just like a Bible study, but with the eyes of our heart, we could see what Christ has done to save us. I'm going to tell you by justification, it would so impact this church, you would not believe it. It would so impact my church and your church, it would be amazing what God would do in the lives of God's people. There is no greater need than to rediscover this great truth of justification by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let me have a sip of water because I'm real scratchy. Amen. Amen. That's all right. Now, right here I want to show you something. I'm going to ask you a question now. And I don't want you to respond. This is not a question for you to respond because some of you respond wrong. And I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to trick you. And you'll see where I'm going to make So don't respond to this question. I just want to get you thinking. The first thing I want to ask you tonight, the first question is this. Don't respond now. I preached this last week. And I said, don't respond. This guy respond. I seen him back there respond. Don't respond, okay? Do you have to be perfectly righteous to go to heaven? Do you have to be perfectly righteous to go to heaven? Now, what does that have to do with justification, you say? Well, in Romans chapter 3, we see all the time this word justified or justification being used. There is another word that is used there that means the same thing. And that word is righteous. Righteousness. Same word. That word righteous and righteousness is the same thing as being justified or justification. The word justification and the word righteous come from the same word. It's a courtroom term. It's a term that means declared righteous. Are you with me? Amen. That's what it means. Now, if I were to ask that question that I asked you to the majority of even preachers, I'd say, do you have to be perfectly righteous to go to heaven? Their response would be, no, you don't have to be perfectly righteous. But the truth is, if you go into heaven, you have to be perfectly righteous. And if you don't believe that tonight, you don't understand God or Jesus or the cross or salvation or justification. The second question I want to ask you this. What do you have to do to go to heaven? You say, do you, do you, if you talk like this, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to do in order for me to go to heaven? You want to talk about that for a minute? Well, this is what you have to do. If you want to go to heaven from the very moment you're born to the moment you die, don't ever have one bad thought. Don't ever say one bad word. Don't ever do one bad deed. Don't ever sin, not one time. Never live perfect from the time you're born to the time you die. And when you get to heaven, the Lord will say, come right on in. You can come in. Well, you say, preacher, my goodness, what hope do I have of going to heaven? What hope does anybody have of going to heaven? If that is what God requires without exception, and it is, God requires you to be totally righteous. If God requires you to be totally righteous, without exception, if that's what He requires, then that requirement of righteousness means that when you, how are you going to go to heaven? And let me, let me say this to you. Are you with me? Yes. The most important need that you have tonight and the most important need that I have tonight and the most important need that everybody in this world has tonight is that they be righteous. That is my greatest need. 
My greatest need is not that I'd be happy. My greatest need is not that I'd be prosperous. My greatest need is not that I'd be successful. But that is what drives this world tonight. This world is consumed with being happy, successful, and prosperous. Listen, here's what you need to understand. Jesus did not come to make you happy. He did not come to make you prosperous. He did not come to give you a carefree life. Jesus come to meet your greatest need and that need was righteousness. That's the greatest need you have. Listen, you can, you can get into heaven without being happy. You can get into heaven without being successful. You can get into heaven without being prosperous. But you cannot get into heaven without being righteous. And that is the greatest need that you have. There's something, listen, there's something that we need desperately and we need that for ourselves. And that thing that we need so desperately, you cannot do for yourself. Amen. Jesus yeah. saves. Yeah. That's what I said last night, isn't it? Amen. Jesus yeah. does it. He's the only one who can make you righteous. Amen. Jesus saves by justif justifying sinners. Praise God, isn't that good? Yes. Jesus saves by justifying sinners so we can be declared righteous by God Almighty. Think about that. That's how you get saved, by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and letting Jesus make you righteous. That ought to be the motivation for you coming and getting saved. That ought to what, that's what ought to motivate you that you would come to Christ and become righteous. Now, people, and I preach through many times, are clueless to their need of God's righteousness. Amen. And that's what we need is God's righteousness. Amen. Now, now, are you with me? Amen. Let me get another sup of water. Amen. 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 I'm glad we got that well tonight. Amen. Now, I'm going to go to the Bible, and I'm going to give you three things here tonight, and we'll be through. Number one, and I'm not going to give you just one, two, three. I'm going to preach on one of them a while, but I'm going to give you three things. Number one, number one, the case of the lost. The case that God builds against lost man, humanity. You find this in chapter, or chapter 3, verses 9 through verse, verse 23, and we'll just look at some of these verses. In justification, God is building a case against sinners. Mm -hmm. There's a courtroom, turn, uh, a, a courtroom scene now, a case is taking place. If you could imagine a courtroom here, and God's the judge, and we're all being judged here tonight. God verses against humanity. He is the prosecuting Attorney, what God sees when he looks at every one of us, this is what God sees. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. That's what Jesus sees when he looks at us. We've got a big problem. Here is the one thing that you need the most is righteousness. And God looks at you and says, you're not righteous. No, not one. In case tonight that you think you're exempt from that, look at verse 12. The Bible says, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Amen. You see that? Look in verse 19. The Bible says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, what's this? that every mouth might be stopped and all the world might become guilty 
before God. Amen. You and I tonight are guilty before God. Sure. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is building a case against us, and that means we are guilty. I'm guilty tonight. You see that? We're guilty. If I'm not justified, I'm guilty. The verdict is handed down by God, and God says, you're guilty. You're guilty. Look at that. It's handed down by the Lord. If I'm guilty, I'm certainly not justified. The Bible tells me in verses 13 through 16, He describes my sin, and He looks at me from the top of my head to the bottom of my foot, and watch what it says. He says, we're all wicked. Look in verse 13. Yes, the Bible says, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way. Look at that. What part of man that is good? None. None of us are good. We're all bad. We're bad all the way through. We're totally depraved. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Totally. God says There's, that's how bad we are. You say, well, preacher... I'm not bad like people that they talk about on the news. Somebody's co committed some kind of hideous crime. I want you to gather up here and listen to me tonight. If God would leave you alone in your sin, there is no sin that you're not capable of doing. There's no level that you're not uh, capable of sinking to. You say, not me. Yes, you, your mom and dad, and all of us are depraved completely. I tell you, it's hard for us to come to that place, but it's true. It's hard for us to believe it. You know what we want to think? We want to think there's a little badness in us. Maybe one or two percent, 20 maybe. But the truth is, the Bible says we're a hundred percent bad. And I'm going to tell you, Baptist people don't want to hear that. But you know what? You don't have any righteousness. You say, I don't have any righteousness. That's what God says. God says there's none righteous, no, not one. The only righteousness that you have is unrighteousness. And the only righteousness you have is self-righteousness. The Bible says all your righteousness, not all your bad, but all your righteousness is as filthy rag. That's what God says. That's not what I say. That's what God says. So we see here tonight a case that God is building. He is the prosecuting attorney against us in a courtroom, and he is bringing evidence to us that we are guilty. Amen. And the only thing you can do is bow your head and say, yes, That's right. I'm guilty. That's right. I'm guilty. And then the second thing I want you to see is the place of the law. The law of God is mentioned down through here in these verses at least ten times. Law is connected to righteousness and justification. The law defines what is righteous and what is not righteous in the moral law. That's what the law is given for us, the Ten Commandments. You can't, you can't be saved by the law. The law will not save you. There's a lot of people trying that. They're trying to keep the law. But the law will not save you. How do I know that? What's this? Verse 19. Now we, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. What's this? That every mouth might be stopped. He says, hush, shut up. Amen. He shuts their mouth. Yeah. But then look, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law shows us what we are. We come. It shows us. It won't save you. You cannot be saved by the law, but you can't be justified by the law, but you can't be justified without the law. Because the law shows you what you are. Amen. That's great, isn't it? Now watch this. The law, it has an important work in our life. It brings us to that place that gets us ready to come 
to the knowledge of our sin, convicts, of us, uh, convicts us of our sin, makes us feel the need of a Savior, and the law prepares us to receive grace, but the law cuts you to the bone. I mean, it whacks you hard. Now watch this. Are you going to heaven tonight? If you died right now, are you going to go to heaven? This is the response of most people. Most people I talk to, I say, do you know if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? Some of them say, yeah. I say, well, why, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? This is the response. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I remember one time I was in uh, Indianapolis there in Park Belts. I was in there buying a suit. And this lady was waiting on me. She's from Tennessee. That kind of pricked my attention. I got talking to her. And I asked her, I said, do you think you're going to go to heaven? She said, yeah. I said, why do you think you're going to heaven? She said, well, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. I said, really? I said, let's put that to the test. She said, okay, and I'm going to give you the same test I gave her. I said, well, have you ever took the name of the Lord in vain? She said, well, yeah. I said, well, the Bible says you're a blasphemer. I didn't say that right there to her, but I'm saying that to you. I said some more things to her. I, let me just come back to you. Matthew, have you ever put anything before God? Have you ever put anything before God? The Bible says you're an idolater. Yeah. You're an idolater, and by your own admission to me tonight, you're an idolater, and you're a blasphemer. Yeah. Have you ever tucked anything that belonged to you? I mean, to see your hands. You didn't respond to this. Well, there's a lot of liars in here, I'll tell you that. <laughs> listen, listen. This. You, you're saying tonight, I'm a, li I, I, I'm a theft. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a thief. I took something that didn't belong to me. Now, you can tell me that tonight. You'd never detect that it didn't belong to you if you want to, but I don't believe that. Because I know you're like me. How many has ever told something that wasn't true? By your own admission, you, you're telling me tonight you're an idolater, a blasphemer, you're a thief, and you're a liar. How are you feeling about yourself now? Well, what do you think about this right here? Have you ever broken the Sabbath? Well, you're a Sabbath breaker. Have you ever dishonored your parents? Well, you're a rebel. What, what about that? Have you ever killed anybody? You say, oh boy, preacher, you've come across a good one now. I've never killed anybody. The Bible said if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. Mm -hmm. I've hated people before. Right. I had a school teacher when I was growing up. I hated him and he hated me. I didn't kill him, but I would have if I could have and got by with it. Yeah. I hated I hated the ground he walked on. Hey, now don't respond to this one, okay? Have you ever had a lustful thought about somebody that wasn't your husband or your wife? The Bible says you're an adulteress. We're not doing too good. We're down, we're down to coveting. Have you ever coveted anything? Well, I can't trust you tonight because you already admitted to me you're a liar. So I don't know whether you coveted or not. Look, look at this. The Bible says you're, a, you're an idolater. You're a, you're a, you're, you're a blasphemer. You're a, you're a liar. You're a thief. You're an adulteress. And the thing about that is, it's not just a one-time thing. It's over and over. I'm telling you, listen, we get this idea that we're a bunch of goody-goodies. We're guilty before God, and the law says so. God brings us to the place, and here we are at this place. He brings us to that place. This is, what, this is what the Bible says, Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderer and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in that lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. God demands perfect righteousness. Now God has built a case against the lost sinner in the word of God. We see ourselves there. And the law says 
the law steps up as a witness and says, I'd like to witness against Thomas Thacker. I'd like to witness against Marty Watkins. And he brings those things out. And so we have a case against sinners. And we have there the place of the law. But thank God. Amen. Thank God. There's the grace of God. God has been telling us about ourselves. In Romans chapter 3, He tells us how we are, how bad we are. He's been telling us how bad we are. He's been telling us about Himself. And as He tells us that, he tells us, he tells us how we can go to heaven. And we say, how in the world can that happen? And then right out of nowhere, in verse 24, he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? Right out of nowhere, Jesus says, he hands down the verdict. He's brought in the case. We're guilty. But he says, forgiven. Forgiven, praise God. Isn't that great? He hands down the verdict to us there that we are forgiven, justified. Praise God. Count it righteousness. Listen, the bad is a race, but it's more than that. Let me say this right. The bad is a race, but it's more than that. God took over here on my side and He took all my sin and He wiped it out, but He did more than that. He came over here on His side and He gathered up all of His righteousness, everything about Him, and He carried all of His righteousness over here and deposited on my side, praise God. Hallelujah. Forgiven, righteous. Isn't that good? Praise God. Adam was innocent, but I'm justified. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Righteous, justified by God's grace. God done for me what I could not do for myself. God did for me what it was impossible for me to do. He said, I'm going to give you that righteousness that you need so desperately, so desperately bad. Isn't that great? Praise God for that. Amen. Jesus. He came and did what I could not do. He came and kept the law. I couldn't keep it. Jesus did what I could not do in His life. And on the cross, He took my place. He traded places with me on the cross. And He took my sin and nailed it to the cross and paid my sin debt in full perpetuation. What does that mean? It means the satisfaction of of God's wrath for me. He satisfied the wrath of God for my sins. That's being justified. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Saved. Saved by justification. I'm going to tell you, that's wonderful tonight. If we'd really get a hold of that, I just don't know, really. If we could really grasp it, I really don't know if we could contain it here tonight. I mean, I don't know if we could be still or not. Amen. I don't know if we could get it. Amen. That's why I'm righteous. That's why I'm justified tonight. It's nothing about me. It's all about Him. Look to Him. Look to Him. See Him. Oh, Lord, see Him. Tonight, it's all about Him. Isn't that great? Hey, we have such a great Savior. Yes, sir. Now, there's a little tale here. I know it's it's not out. It's not true, but you'll get to you'll get the message. You hear these things about you hear these things about people dying going up pearly, pearly gates, talking to Saint Peter. I mean, you know, I know that ain't true, but you'll get the gist. Here's this man. He dies. He goes up to the pearly gates. And St. Peter comes out and he says, can I help you? And he said, well, I'd like to get into heaven. He said, well, it, it's not going to be too bad. He said, you need a million points. <laughs> he said, have you got anything you can make any points with? He said, well, he said, I'm a, I've been a Baptist for 50 years. St. <laughs> Peter said, wow, glory, that's wonderful. You get one point. 
<laughs> he says, one point. How many did you say I need? You need a million. You got one point? He said, you got anything else? He said, well, he said, I've been a deacon for 25 years. St. Peter said, wow, that's great. You get one point. How many did I need? A million. I got two, right? He said, you got anything else? He said, well, he said, I've been tithing for the past five years. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that great, Brother Rick? <laughs> he said, St. Peter said, Wow, wow. He said, You get one point. How many do I need? You need a million. I got three points. That guy said, Good night. He said, The only way you can get in here is by the grace of God. And I say, praise God to that. Amen. Amen. You know what? There's a lot of people trying to get to heaven. I got a lot of people down home. They actually think that they can do something to get to heaven. I talked to a guy the other day. He about made me want to puke. I was, I was down there at a junk sale. We have those things down there. And he come up to me and I said, hey, won't you come up to our account meeting? And he said, you're not one of them old Baptists that believes once saved, always saved, are you? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you doing anything to save yourself? He said, no, I, I'm not doing anything to save myself. But he said, I'm doing a lot to keep myself. I said, are you crazy? You know what I said to him? I said, listen, this conversation's over. I don't have no time to talk to you. Anybody that's that dumb, I ain't got time to waste my time with them. Amen? And then he said some stuff. And if I hadn't walked off, we'd had a fight. I mean, I'd, been a, I'd gotten a flash. I mean, I, I don't like to hear people downgrade my Lord after Jesus went to Calvary and paid such a great price for my sins oh to think you're going to get to heaven for something you're doing why you're foolish it's foolish we're justified by God's grace I'm going to give you an illustration I'm going to give you two things that I'm through I heard Adrian Rogers give this one time he said uh, what kind of car do you like what kind of car do you like I mean, a real nice car. Something you wouldn't even think about getting, but you like it. Oh, a Cadillac. What kind? I mean, just... CTS. A CTS Cadillac. What, what do you think it costs? Probably about fifty, sixty thousand. dollars Let's say sixty. Yeah. Thomas, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy you a $60,000 Cadillac. I'm so glad. And I'm going to give it to you. And you know what Thomas is going to say to me? He's going to say, well, that's, that's a great preacher. But he said, I, you know, I can't take it. He said, I can't do it. Watch me. He said, <laughs> he said I, I tell you, I tell, he said, he said, I tell you what I'm going to do, though. He said, I really like that Cadillac. I'm going to help you buy that Cadillac. And I'm going to give you a quarter. <laughs> and I'll give $59,999.75. And Thomas comes to church and you say, boy, you got a nice Cadillac. He said, yeah, Terry bought that for me. You see how insulting that is. That's what you do when you try to say that you're saved by some kind of work you do for God. I mean, that, that's just like slapping the Lord in the face. Two things I'm going to say to you right here. You can have it, Brother Thomas. Two things I'm going to say to you right here. What do you have faith in? What are you trusting in? Here it is. Two things. Now. Turning from your badness is a hard thing to do. There's people tonight right here in this area if they realize that they could just turn from their badness. badness. They're, they're into some kind of sin. They're drinking or immorality or drugs or something like that. Or being dishonest or something they're into. If they would just be willing to turn their back on that, God would save them. And a lot of them would go to hell because they just can't do it. I heard J. Harold Smith say one time, we had him in church, 
where I pastor, and he said, uh, he said this man, he came down where he was, and he told him, he said, John, he said, God sent me down here to ask you to come to the altar tonight. And he sat, man, looked at me, and he said, Preacher, he said, I can't go down there tonight. He said, I'm a businessman. He said, I've got a deal going this week, and I'm going to make about $30,000. He said, it's crooked. And if he, sa he said, if I got saved tonight, he said, I couldn't make that deal. Mm. He said, ain't no way I get saved tonight. That night, mm. that man's wife called him. He went to his house, and he was screaming as he died, saying, get me out of the far. Turning from badness is a hard thing to do. Are you with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. But listen to this. Turning from goodness is a harder thing to do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many Baptist people who think they're going to heaven over something they've done. They're not saved. They don't have no personal relationship with the Lord. But they will not turn away from that and turn to Christ. Listen, turning from goodness is a hard thing to do. I'm going to tell you, you can't go to heaven on nothing you're doing. You can't brag about nothing you've done. You can't do it yourself. It's through Christ. And him alone. Amen. Oh, listen, every head bowed, every eye closed. I know tonight in this church, I know the majority of you are faithful. You come. You've been here night after night. And I, I want you to know tonight, I don't know why God's given me all these messages. But if you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to tell you, you ought to get down here on this altar and say, God, I want to be saved. I'm tired of playing games. Brother Tony Feeney told me just, just today, I think it was today, his, 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 uh, his uh, uh, son-in-law, John, he was having a service the other night. He come up where he was, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Papa, he said, I'm lost and I need to be saved. I'm gonna tell you, I, don't know your I don't know your shape or condition. I have no idea. And I, and everybody, you may, everybody in here might know the Lord. I don't know that for sure. But I tell you, if you don't know Christ, you ought to come and be saved. And if you know Christ, if you know Him tonight, I tell you what you ought to do. You ought to come to this altar, fall on your face, and thank God that He has saved you by His grace. That He has deemed you righteous. That He has helped let down the, let down the verdict that you are innocent. That you are forgiven. That God has rans ransomed you from sin. That you're on your way to heaven. I'm going to tell you, you ought to come and thank Him tonight. If God is dealing with you about anything in your life, if you're not living the way you should, if there's some sin or secret sin in your life, you're not willing to give up, I'm telling you, you ought to lay that down tonight because Jesus has done such a great work for you. Hey, listen, you can have revival if you realize tonight that Jesus Christ has justified you freely by His grace.